All right, here we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Marty Kotler. Thank you for attending this webinar on CPT and ICD-10 code pairing. This is part three. Just a little disclaimer. The information in this webinar is for educational purposes, and it's not intended to be a substitute for your thorough clinical decision making. It's not intended to be a substitute for your billing protocols. It's not intended to be legal advice. We don't provide legal advice. Every attempt has been made to make certain that the information in this presentation is 100% accurate. However, it's not guaranteed. Let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Again, my name is Dr. Marty Kotler. I am a chiropractor. I practiced for 16 years prior to starting my company, Target Coding. I am a certified professional compliance officer, certified billing and coding specialist, and my company has been helping thousands of chiropractors and their staff members for over 14 years. Now, I consider myself kind of unique because you know most chiropractors are not certified coders. Most certified coders are not chiropractors. So you'll see during this webinar how I combine the two specialties to make sure you're doing things properly, you're complying with all state and federal laws and rules, and you are maximizing reimbursement and getting paid what you deserve. So today we're talking about CPT and ICD-10 uh, ICD code pairing, what does that mean? What is that all about? I look at it like pairing wine and food. I also look at it like, you know, if you don't drink, maybe you wanna look at it like peanut butter and chocolate. Peanut butter alone, terrific. Chocolate alone, terrific. Put it together, amazing. So CPT and ICD-10 code pairing, so it's your procedure codes and your diagnosis codes. They should pair, they should link. So understand the what and the why. CPD codes are what you're doing, like a chiropractic adjustment, 98940, that's a CPT code, that's what you're doing. ICD-10 codes are why you are doing what you're doing. Example, a subluxation is a diagnosis, so chiropractic adjustment, CPT code, procedure, matches, pairs beautifully with subluxation. They have to pair. If they don't pair, you may need to give money back to an insurance company. Here, let me give you a little introduction to this. So in your practice, many chiropractors do mechanical traction. That is CPT code 97012. Mechanical traction, 97012. It's a procedure where the patient is lying on a table. Many of you know what traction is. It's to separate and stretch the spinal segments. You should have the clinical rationale as to why you're doing mechanical traction and why you're doing it. So mechanical traction, what does that link with? What CPT code, I'm sorry, what diagnosis code would mechanical traction link with? So 97012 is mechanical traction. What diagnosis? would link properly with mechanical traction. Knee pain, no. Knee pain doesn't match with mechanical traction. Mechanical traction is a spinal procedure. So if you match that with knee pain or a shoulder problem, that won't work. Okay, let's do the other way. Let's say you come up with a diagnosis on a patient of myofascial pain syndrome in the neck, cervical myofascial pain syndrome myalgia of the neck muscles, that's M7912. So what are you gonna do for that? What's good for that? What's a good CPT code? What's a good procedure to do that pairs beautifully with myofascial pain? Show you in a few minutes. Just wanna get you thinking a little bit before I give you the answers. Here's another example. What are you doing? Chiropractic adjustment. Sure, many of you are billing 98941 on most of your patients. Why? What's the diagnosis code that pairs with 98941? And let's do the opposite. You have a patient that comes in, you diagnose the patient with a subluxation. That's M9901 if it's in the neck, if it's a cervical subluxation. Okay, you diagnose the patient with a cervical subluxation. There's your diagnosis. Terrific, M9901. But what does that pair with? 
what procedure, what CPG code? I'll show you in a few minutes. So this is called decision making. Decision making. When a patient comes in, what are you going to do? You're going to do history, exam, take a look at x-rays, maybe ask for diagnostic tests from other doctors. This is the formal definition of decision making right out of the AMA CPT code book. Decision making refers to the complexity of establishing a diagnosis and or selecting a management option as measured by three things. The amount of records and tests that you have to obtain, review and analyze, the number of diagnosis codes and the procedure codes and the risk of complications. So after you do a history and exam, decision making, what's the diagnosis? What Do I need to get x-rays? Do I need to get records from other doctors? Am I gonna do manual therapy or massage therapy? Am I gonna use ice or heat? Many of these things are automatic. It's like driving a car. If you have to make a right turn, it's just natural, it just happens. You could even be talking to someone and doing something else. You don't have to go, okay, I am going to make a right turn now. Wait, I have to step on the brake. I have to put on my signal. I have to start turn. You know, it's just natural. So for many of these things, it's just natural. After you speak to a patient, after you do an exam, hey, you probably know what to do. You're probably doing the same thing on most of your patients, and it's probably working out. <laughs> I hope it is. So. You have, you know, am I going to use ice, heat, manual therapy, massage therapy? Am I going to use a TENS machine on day one? Or am I going to wait a little while? Am I going to order an MRI? Maybe I'll wait. Does this patient need nutritional consultations? Does this patient need decompression or just regular traction? Laser or just a hot pack? What's the diagnosis? When am I going to do a re-exam? This is all part of decision making. All right, so now let's get into diagnosis codes, ICD-10 codes. It starts with the World Health Organization. They're responsible for putting together ICD-10. ICD-10 stands for International Classification of Diseases. We're up to the 10th revision. It took 25 years to go from ICD-9 to ICD-10. It's not gonna take 25 years to go to ICD-11. ICD-11 will be around within the next five years. ICD-10 started on October 1st, 2015, so it's been around five years already. You must use ICD-10 codes if you're a HIPAA-covered entity. Guess what? You are a HIPAA covered entity. Every single one of you listening to this, you're a HIPAA covered entity. And if you don't think you are, give us a call, set up a free 15 minute consultation and I'll explain to you why you are a HIPAA covered entity and you must use ICD-10 codes and you must have a HIPAA compliance program in place. Mm, we'll get to that another time or maybe another day. So understand the what and why. Your CPD codes are what you're doing. Your diagnosis codes are why you're doing them. You shouldn't pick diagnosis codes just because they feel right. Like when a patient would come into my office when I first started practicing, my first six, seven years in practice, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, um, So a patient would come in and say, Dr. Kotler, I have pain in my back. It's radiating down my leg. Sciatica. I didn't do any orthopedic tests. I didn't do any neurological tests. Sciatica, maybe it wasn't sciatica. Maybe it was some sort of other type of lumbar radiculopathy, you know, but I didn't, you know, I just did it because it felt right. That's not the way to do it. So let's start off with a few of the most common diagnosis codes, subluxation, of course. These are the M99 codes. We also have traumatic subluxation codes. They begin with the letter S. Make sure if you're using S codes that you understand these are injury related, trauma related, and you have to pick an encounter, either initial, a subsequent, or sequela. Pain and symptom codes, they're nice, but they don't really get paid that well. You know, codes that describe symptoms are okay. Whenever I teach my seminars and webinars and I talk about neck pain, which is, uh, yeah, I'll show you here, M54.2. A lot of doctors and staff members go, what? Neck pain, that's a diagnosis? That's not a diagnosis, that's a symptom. You know what? It's true, it's both. It's a diagnosis, M54.2, and it's also a symptom, neck pain. So if that's all you got, that's all you got. You should be able to get some other things. I don't know, is there muscle spasm? Here are the muscle spasm codes. Muscle strain, these are short-term treatment. Subluxations, I don't think insurance companies know how to place a, a visit on that, a visit limit or a, a DRG, a diagnosis code related guideline. But on a strain, 
eh, six, eight visits, two visits, three visits, muscle spasm, two, three visits. These are short-term treatment diagnosis codes. Myalgia, these are very good codes. I mentioned myofascial pain syndrome earlier. There's different types of myalgia, neuralgia, fibrositis, soft tissue disorders. And then we have diagnosis codes that I consider more long-term treatment diagnosis codes. Radiculopathy, very common, M50, 412, lumbar radiculopathy. What CPT codes match with these? I'll show you in a minute. Now, as far as making sure that you are justifying your diagnosis code, so if you diagnose a patient with cervical radiculopathy, what should be in your notes? What should your notes say? What should your exam show? What should, what does your record say to justify it? See, I know some doctors, they'll submit a cervical radiculopathy diagnosis to a managed care plan and it comes back denied. You ask for 12 visits, we're not giving you any, or maybe we'll give you one. And the doctor will say, wait, I use the long-term treatment diagnosis like cervical radiculopathy. The doctor sends me the notes, I look at the subjective, doesn't say anything about the pain radiating into an arm or numbness or tingling. It's just not there. Orthopedic tests were all normal. Normal range of motion, normal muscle strength, normal reflexes. See why that's not going to work? Your diagnosis must be justified with the clinical rationale. Disc disorders and disc displacements, terrific diagnosis codes. You need an MRI for these. You can't do this without an MRI or CT, you need imaging for disc disorders and disc displacements. Sprains are very good. These are also considered long-term treatment diagnosis codes. Auto accidents, yeah, every patient that came into my practice that was in some sort of whiplash type injury, hyperflexion, hyperextension type injury, they all had sprained ligaments and sprained and strained muscles, it was both. You ever diagnose a patient with a sacroiliac sprain? It's an excellent diagnosis. There's no laterality, which I think is ridiculous, but that's the way it goes. Maybe with the next update, there'll be laterality on this. Actually, there isn't. I looked already. The update for ICD-10 came out already. It becomes effective October 1st. At a quick glance, I didn't see any diagnosis codes that really pertain to chiropractic that have changed, but you'll see in an upcoming newsletter, or if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you'll see updates. There are other updates coming up. There are new E&M codes coming up. Acupuncture is gonna be covered by Medicare. 985831 was deleted. Dry needling, there's a code. There's quite a few updates that begin January 1st. As far as diagnosis codes, there weren't that many updates, but for sacroiliac sprain, you might diagnose this. There should be a SI joint sprain on the right, SI joint sprain on the left, if we want to get specific, because there's two SI joints. But right now, there's one diagnosis, either if it's right SI joint subluxation or sprain, or left, or both. S33.6. How do you justify it? Need to do Yeomans and Ganslins. I don't care what chiropractic college you went to, even if you went to a, a principled subluxation-based chiropractic college. I know some chiropractors, they go, Dr. Marty, I don't own a reflex hammer. I don't check for, you know, I don't, have, I don't own a pinwheel. Uh, I, don't, I don't check blood pressure. I'm subluxation-based. That's fine. But if you are going to diagnose a patient with any type of sacroiliac condition, you better do Yeomans or Ganslins. And if you don't, and you're in a malpractice case, state board, you're gonna lose. So do some of the basics like sciatica. I saw a doctor, he diagnosed a patient with sciatica. I said, doc, do you do straight leg raise? Nah, I don't do straight leg raise, come on. Do straight leg raise, a basic orthopedic test. It will cover you. It'll cover your butt in a malpractice case or if the patient files a complaint against you with the state board. I had a few doctors where patients filed complaints against the doctor because of their fees. One patient wanted their money back. One patient thought the doctor was charging too much, reported the doctor to the board. The board asks for the financial records and they also ask for the documentation. A couple of chiropractors there documentation was horrible. They diagnosed the patient with sciatica. They didn't do straight leg raise. They didn't do anything. 
Another doctor, his notes just said SALT. SALT, that's what every note said. It's an acronym for same as last time. Not gonna work. You're gonna diagnose a patient with sciatica. The patient has to say, I have pain in my back. It's radiating down my leg. Or maybe the patient doesn't have back pain. Maybe it's just dermatomal pain. Maybe it's just numbness. Maybe the patient just has weakness in their calf. And, and you're gonna think you, you diagnose that as a, a sciatic problem. That's fine. Put on your doctor hat and figure out what's causing this patient's lower extremity pain or numbness or tingling or weakness. Orthopedic tests, do a few of those braggards. Does the patient have an antalgic lean? You want to justify your diagnosis codes. Headaches, aura, with aura, without aura, intractable, not intractable. Make sure you know the definition of these terms. Intractable means the patient is just not responding to conventional treatment. I, whenever a patient came into my office and said, Dr. Kotler, I have migraine headaches. I would always ask the patient, what do you do for it? Some patients would go, Dr. Kotler, I've tried everything, nothing works. That's intractable. So I guess you could see, besides being a certified compliance consultant, certified billing and coding specialist, I'm also a chiropractor. I practice, I'm in the trenches. You could see now how I'm combining my chiropractic experience with coding and billing and getting paid properly experience. You see how I'm doing that? Acute post-traumatic, those of you that CPI patients, acute post-traumatic headaches or chronic post-traumatic headaches. What's the determining factor? It's very simple. Acute versus chronic is three months. Patient says, I was in a car accident. Ever since the car accident, I've been getting headaches. How long ago was the car accident, Mr. Jones? It was four months ago. Mm, that's chronic. It was four weeks ago. Mm, that's acute. This is common. Just about every single patient, regardless of their symptoms. You could have a patient come in and say, Doc, I, I sprained my knee playing tennis. They're probably going to have some abnormal posture, regardless of their condition. So there's a whole bunch of diagnosis codes. Then we have CPT codes. Chiropractic CPT codes, 989 41, 42, and 43. Modalities, supervised modalities, hot packs, cold packs, mechanical traction, unattended stim. There are nice photos of all of those, the top three, the most common. And then we have constant attendance modalities like attended electrical stim and ultrasound. Those are the two most common constant attendance modalities. Therapeutic procedures, there's a lot of them. Here are the four most common. One-on-one, -on -one, you have to show you're applying clinical skills. Timed code, exercises, 110, neuromuscular re-education, manual therapy, therapeutic activities. So here again, I'm gonna ask you, what are you doing, why are you doing them? Your codes should pair, just like food and wine, just like peanut butter and chocolate. So I asked earlier, you're doing mechanical traction. What does that pair with? Cervical radiculopathy, M5412 is a beautiful pairing or disc degeneration. Next, you do myofascial release, deep soft tissue work. You're using CPT code 97140. What does that pair with? Myofascial pain syndrome, M7912. One of the most perfect pairings right there. You could also use it on a herniated disc. So, sommelier, you may have heard that term, sommelier. That's a person who is a wine master, a wine and food pairing expert. I'm not a sommelier, but wait, wait a second, I'm a coding sommelier. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not an expert in Chardonnay, Merlot, and, you know, Pinot Grigio, but I am an expert on pairing your CPD codes and diagnosis codes. So I'll call myself a coding sommelier. Here's another one. Therapeutic exercise is one of the most common rehab codes, 97110. What does that pair with? Ah, pairs with a beautiful right shoulder stiffness, M6, M25.611. How about an adjustment? Do a chiropractic adjustment? What should that pair with? Subluxation. Let me show you, explain to you what would not pair properly you're going to do a chiropractic spinal adjustment and bill 98940. 
that's okay, so far so good. Now you're gonna choose a diagnosis. You're gonna choose M9906, wait a second. A spinal adjustment, 98940, does not pair properly with a knee subluxation. So this pairing, this is in a book. I just wanna share with you if you are looking for a complete guide to pairing, it's in chapter one of a book that I wrote. It's called The Book on the Best Chiropractic ICD-10 and CPD Codes to Improve Reimbursement. If you're looking to learn more about this, in chapter one, I show you how to pair your CPT codes, like I'm talking to you now, for the, the all the codes that you use in your practice, like 110, 112, traction, therapeutic activities, ADLs, massage, manual therapy. In chapter two, I show you the diagnosis codes that pay the most visits. I break them down into long-term treatment diagnosis codes and short-term treatment diagnosis codes. That's in chapter two. Also in chapter two, you get a whole bunch of cheat sheets on spinal diagnosis with the hierarchy, which ones pay the most, which ones pay the least. I have cheat sheets for personal injury patients, cheat sheets on complicating factors like diabetes and anxiety and that stuff. Chapter three, I get into the clinical. Chapter three, I took off my coding hat, I put on my clinical hat, and I show you. I also got input from some other experts in the chiropractic field on how to clinically put together your findings so you could justify the diagnosis code you're reporting. That's in chapter three. A little bit here on billing and coding compliance. If you see Medicare and actually all your insurance companies, if you're billing, they want you to be proactive. If you're dealing with ASH, American Specialty Health, you are required to be proactive and do certain things. I'll show you that in a minute. Medicare requires you to have a written policy and procedure manual, a billing and coding policy. Even if you don't see Medicare patients, you should have a billing and coding policy manual. Who is this for? This is not for the patients. This is for the staff. This is so your staff members don't become disgruntled employees and report you to the board. This is good to protect your business, doctors. I look at my clients, although some of you may be older than me, I look at my clients as my children. I wanna protect you. I wanna put a coat of armor around you. A billing and coding policy manual does that. You wanna have policies and procedures. This is an actual example of one of our policies and procedures. Shows you how to do record reviews. Here's another policy right out of our manual staff training. If you see Medicare patients, you need to go to the exclusions list, put your name in there, make sure you haven't been excluded. This is for your staff too. This is basically for anyone that has anything to do with Medicare patients. So your front desk receptionist takes money, co-pays, co-insurance from a Medicare patient, put that person's name in the exclusions list. There's the website, exclusions.oag.hhs.org. You have a CA that's entering CPT codes into your EHR for Medicare patients. Put that person's name in that exclusions list. See if they've been excluded. If you have a, a, a staff member that just stuffs envelopes, I don't know, I'm just doing an example, has nothing to do with Medicare patients, is just stuffing envelopes. Well, that person doesn't need to have their name put in the exclusions list. So put in the name. Here, you're about to hire Dr. Douglas, chiropractor. You've been busy. You want to hire an associate chiropractor? Here comes Dr. Douglas. Seems like a great guy. Put his name in the exclusions list. Uh-oh, he's excluded. He cannot see your Medicare patients and probably your Cigna and Blue Cross Blue Shield patients if you're dealing with American Specialty Health. Here's another doctor. This chiropractor is excluded from the Medicare program because she didn't pay her student loan. She cannot see your Medicare patients. If she does and you're getting paid, you are going to have big problems, fines, penalties, reported to the board. You might get kicked out of a federally funded program. This is what you want. Put your name in. It says no results found. Print this out. Put it in your compliance manual. Now, you should have policies on co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance. Is it okay to waive co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance? The answer is maybe. Depends on the situation. Can't do it routinely. All my teachers, I waive the copay. Bad, no good. You know, there's a building next to me. It's a Bank of America with 200 employees. They all have fantastic Aetna insurance. It pays great. 
I'm going to tell all these employees, just bring me your insurance information, no copay, no deductible, except pay payment is, you know, full payment. Ah, no good. There are times where you need to waive copays and deductibles if you want to learn more about that. Set up a consultation with us. What's your policy on patient discounts? What's your policy on offering free exams or, you know, we're offering a special exam, x-rays and adjustment, all of that for $79. Now here comes a PI patient. We do the same thing and we're billing 500. Ah, no good, no good. Look at this chiropractor. He got dinged for $80,000. This wasn't money back. This was a fine, a penalty because he was giving free electrical stim to his Medicare patients. A staff member called him in or someone. This was a key tam. It's a Latin word for whistleblower. You may have heard that term in the news a lot lately, a whistleblower. Somebody called this doctor in for giving free stim to his Medicare patients. Was it a disgruntled employee? Maybe. Was it an unhappy patient? Maybe. Was it a jealous chiropractor down the road? Maybe. I don't know who called this in. Somebody ratted this guy out. Maybe he deserved to be ratted out. I don't know the whole case, but he got fined nearly $80,000 for giving free stim to his Medicare patients. So reevaluate what you're doing. Speak to experts. If you don't want to speak to us, that's fine. Speak to someone. Just don't keep doing well for our Medicare patients. We do this and our regular patients, we do that. On our PI patients, we bill 500 a visit. But when a Medicare patient comes in, we just charge them you know, $40 and we throw everything in, stem, extremity adjustment. Our insurance patients, we do this. Oh, our in-network patients, we only do that. Our, oh, our out-of-network patients, we do this. Our Medicare Part B patients, we do that. But Medicare Part C, oh no, we do something else. See, that's dangerous, careful. Prevention is the key. Staff members, if you are the office manager, make sure you are on top of the billing and coding, put together billing and coding policies and procedures, have open lines of communication with the rest of the staff, conduct formal trainings and log them into a training manual. Just a few closing comments before we get to questions and answers. Here's our contact information. See what questions have come in. Oh, before we get to questions and answers, we offer a compliance program. It consists of billing and coding, HIPAA, and OSHA. We do the heavy lifting for you. We charge more than most others. If you're shopping around for a compliance program for your practice, which you are required, I would say at least 50% of you listening to this do not have a compliance plan. It's required. Ask your state board. Ask your friend who's a healthcare attorney in your state. Ask your status, if you're a member of the state association, ask your state association, are you required to have a compliance program? You're going to hear yes. And if you hear no, let me know who that person is. I'd like to speak to that person and find out. Maybe there's something unusual going on in your state. It's mandatory. So if you're shopping around for a start shopping around is what I recommend if you don't have one, you're going to find out that ours is the most expensive. Yes, it's not scary expensive, it's $1.99 a month, a month, but it's gonna be more than most others. Why? Because we do more. You know, I love Hondas and Toyotas. I love Hondas and Toyotas, fantastic cars. We don't sell Hondas and Toyotas. We sell Ferraris, Rolls Royce, BMWs, and Mercedes, and Teslas. We have a lot of doctors across the country using our compliance program. Here's Dr. Toke. Getting compliant is not something you look forward to. However, target coding made it easy and simple to digest. Dr. Weinberg and Jill, been a game changer. Always available. We love target coding. Thank you, Dr. Kotler and Natasha. Now, besides webinars and compliance programs, we do a lot more target coding. A lot of people think all we do is uh, webinars, free webinars. No, we have CA boot camps. Staff members listening to this, we have covered every single possible job description a CA could have from front desk to the back desk to billing and collections 
to doing the notes, to patient relations, to CPT coding, to being an office manager. We cover it at all with our CA bootcamp. What else do we do? You know we do billing. We charge 7%. Give us a call if you're tired of your present billing company or you're tired of hiring staff and training them and then firing them, hiring a billing CA, training them, and then they quit. The revolving door, get a billing company. Shop around for a billing company. Give us a shot. We charge 7%. What else do we do? You know, we do credentialing. You need a PTAN number. You need to be re-credentialed, revalidated. You need a CAQH ID number, NPI number. Are you a new doctor needing a, need to be in network with any plans? Contact us. We do credentialing. You're bringing on, you're busy. Hopefully all of you are busy and you are so busy that you're looking to bring on an associate chiropractor. Believe it or not, I have some clients, not most, most have been hurting because of the pandemic, I have some clients, they are busier than ever. I just had one of my clients in Clearwater, Florida. She just started her practice six weeks ago. She's packed. I said, Doc, I can't believe how well you are doing in the pandemic. She said to me, Dr. Marty, if there wasn't a pandemic, I don't know what I would do. I would be so busy, I'd probably have to hire an associate already. So if you're looking to hire an associate doctor that needs a P10 number, you know, we do credentialing. I mentioned the book. That we offer. It's an excellent book. Hopefully, it'll be a movie one day. No, just kidding. So, the book gives you all these different things and different chapters, forms. I don't care what software you have, you could have the greatest software in the world. You still need forms. Like what, Dr. Kotler? What about a fight back letter? You get denied. We have a whole bunch of fight back letters. What about a letter of medical necessity for a stand up desk or orthotics or a pillow or a back brace? Software doesn't have that built in. You need intake forms, you need HIPAA forms, Medicare forms. How about a sample Medicare treatment plan? How about a sample Medicare soap note? Acupuncture forms, physical therapy forms, telehealth forms. We offer a forms packet. We can email them to you today. They're all in Microsoft Word. You could do whatever you want with them once you get them. You might say, you know what? I would like you to just check my soap notes. I just need a soap note checkup. We do that too. How about ASH? You need help with ASH? Two things that people always ask us when it comes to ASH. Dr. Kotler, can you help us get more visits out of ASH? Yes, we can. Dr. Kotler, can you show us how to get more cash out of our ASH patients? Yes, we can. Schedule a live training for your practice. Put all your staff in one room and we do a training on ASH just for your practice. Or we have a video you can buy if you don't want the one-on-one. -on -one. We have memberships. Once the pandemic slows down, we'll start doing our seminars again. So we're going to go take a look and see what questions come, have come in. Again, I want to thank everybody for attending. Here's my contact information. Email Dr. Kotler at Target Coding, website Target Coding. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Go to YouTube and check out our YouTube videos. Go to YouTube, go into the search, type in target coding, subscribe to our YouTube channel. By the way, this video, this webinar is gonna get posted to our YouTube channel. Assuming the audio came out and everything sounds clear and good, this is gonna be on our, so just in case you wanna watch it again, you wanna send it to a friend, uh, you have an office manager that doesn't know how to put together a billing and coding policy manual, Maybe you want to have him or her watch it. You have a compliance officer in your practice. Maybe you want to have her or him watch it. So go to the YouTube channel. All right, let's go take a look and see what questions have come in.